So I've got to rush because I'm at the end here and we're late. But those two presentations from my colleagues were just terrific. And they really have laid down, I think, the groundwork. So I've got to, let me just try to pick up and emphasize a few points here and there as I piece through it. The one thing that they, through their demeanor, did that I like, and it is somewhat in response to the questions, is that we have to work together. And so I, what I like about this meeting is that we create the, 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 the template for conversation. There is nothing that we are talking about that is easy. This is all hard stuff, and it can get emotional, and it can get very ugly quick. So at the end of the day, if we can't have the conversation in rooms like this, we're going to be in big trouble because at the end of the day, we really are all in it together. I don't know whether I understood the EGAP slide, but it's form I'm, what I'm seeing is we're getting past the point of genetic exceptionalism. Genetics is medicine. It's in the game. And so I'll learn from you later why I need to be careful about saying it. But by my way of thinking, we are at the point now where, you know, it's, it's, we're talking about medicine. And I think that becomes sort of, for me, very important. Implementing it then provides opportunities as well as it does challenges. So both of my colleagues talked a little bit about costs. And, and I want to just make sure you really get costs really get it. If you don't get it in the way that you, I mean, in your DNA get it, you're going to be off in outer space and you are going to miss it. These curves on the left and the top two represent physician and hospital directed care delivery. The slope of those curves is breathtaking. This is where the money is. Physician and hospital directed care. The other one's durable medical equipment, pharmacy, and all that kind of stuff. But the action is here. And that's how you get to $2.5 trillion of expenditure. What's scary is the right side. And that is looking from today out. And look at the top two curves again. And it doesn't take but our heartbeat before you get to $4.3 trillion. That cannot happen. It will not happen. And so. If you look at it only from the point of view of just Medicare and Medicaid, this was the bend the cost curve slide when President Bush the second was in office. And he says, we got a, a, a problem ladies and gentlemen, with Social Security here in America. And the Congressional <laughs> Budget Office, the Congressional Budget Office said, look here, dude, you ain't got a Social Security problem. You got a Medicare and Medicaid problem. That curve is going to get hammered, hammered down like you cannot believe. And it will not be surgical. And there's no state, by the way, in this country, not one state that's got any budget relief, and it's not going to be in deep doo-doo because of Medicaid. So they're in deep doo-doo. The only place you can off-shift costs left is to the consumer. And the consumer out-of-pocket costs looks like that, and wages look like that. And there is nobody in this room that believes that wages are going to go up. So it's over. Now, the highest component of escalation in cost is not utilization. It's unit costs, the price of things. So all of you that are involved with companies that make stuff, pay attention. Unit costs are the highest escalation in healthcare. Number two, healthcare is complicated as hell already without you. <laughs> and as my colleague said, half the time inconsistent with the best science. And so these folks are in deep doo-doo. 2001, there was the Crossing the Quality Chasm report. If you have not read the theology of the redesign of healthcare in America, you need to go back and look at the, at least the executive summary because it was very clear about what had to happen. And what has to happen is, anybody, everybody knows the mantra of safe, effective, Timely, efficient, equitable, patient-centered. But the rules for redesign, evidence-based decision-making, continuous decrease of waste, anticipation of needs, patient as source of control, all of that undergirded by shared knowledge and free flow of information. So there's all this stuff pouring into the delivery system every day, busting the bank and making everyone crazy, and the assets being pissed away half the time. And then we get you. <laughs> and this is what, 
we see as the scope of that curve. So yes, everybody's talked about how many tests, and you know the, the, the sense of it. Our estimates are probably between three and four billion in spending from 2006 to nine, but then by doing some calculations that we're pretty confident about and that we have published and put into the public domain, we sort of see uh, that national spending will reach, uh, reach five billion in 2010, eight percent of national spending on clinical lab. And we believe that today, while it accounts for a fairly small amount of a $20 billion in vitro diagnostic market, that we believe that uh, spending has grown substantially over the last 10 years with the annual growth rate of an estimated 12 to 15 percent, rates much higher than for clinical laboratory services as a whole. And with these scenarios, we project uh, that molecular diagnostics will reach between 15 and 25 billion by 20. We're talking now real money, real dollars, real stuff, no playing around. For our company alone, 500 million in 2010, because you got to remember now the size and scale of, of, of a company the size of United Healthcare and United Health Group, and spending per member increased by about 14 percent a year on average between 28 and 2010. And this is what really worries us. The volume of all of that and the pace of discovery increasing the complexity of medical decision making. So human, if you think about the facts per decision around the, in the growing complexity of the genomic movement and the thing in the red is flat, human cognitive capability. So can you imagine what is about to happen to the expenditures in health care for your stuff tomorrow and what it means to this country overall. Now, having said that, let me address the question that just came up. We love innovation. The problem that we have, if you look at it from an entrenched, narrow, managed care world, is every new thing, and, 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 and you heard it two presentations ago, every new thing in healthcare costs more than the old thing. The only industry where that weirdness occurs. You can't buy a thumb drive anymore. They just give it to you when you go into the store. You know, memory, you know, like, man, I can buy 100 megabytes of memory and it's like $3.22. What goes on in the rest of industry? But in medicine, every time we see something new, the price is higher. And it gets, we don't know who it's appropriate for, so you don't have, you have a real hard time figuring out who you apply it to. And then when we do have guidance, we piss it away half the time inconsistent with the guidance. So when we see new stuff, we usually go running down the hallway screaming, which is not the place to be. Because what you really want is to find things that are going to take costs out of the system and improve overall quality. In fact, I said it wrong. Bad me. I, I, I violated the theology. What we are looking for is innovation that improves quality and that takes cost out of the system because it's quality first always and cost decrease second. So that's what we're looking for and we do need to be on a seek and find mission to find those things that are going to do it. And so we look for innovation. So how do we think about innovation? First of all, know this. Innovation for innovation's sake is meaningless. I could care less that you got three more bells and two more whistles than the other guy. It means nothing to me. Just because it's new is worth nothing. Does it disruptively replace more expensive and less effective traditional interventions? Is it new value propositions, improved performance based on new performance criteria? My cell phone, my smartphone, it beats the hell out of phones because I don't even care that it's a phone. Whole new value proposition. Does it optimize health outcomes? Does it make preventive and clinical care simpler and less complex to deliver and more convenient? Does it, most important, move hospital care to the outpatient, outpatient to the home and to the community. Now we're talking. We can do some stuff like that. We got a chance to do it. So we want to support new breakthroughs in health care. True breakthroughs in health care are rare. Usually they're incremental, additive, and so the new imaging procedure comes, you add it to the old one, and then you get a discrepancy between the new one and the old one, then you do a third one, and then a fourth one, and next thing you know, we're all in deep trouble. 
So what you want is, is things that are, that, that can, you don't want halfway technologies. You want to get straight through uh, to the source of the problem, to the root causes. So we like the idea that genetics is going to offer that possibility. Cut through the crap, get to the source, eliminate the halfway stuff, and you've got an opportunity to go forward. So to us, it does make sense. The issue, though, is left to its own devices. The world will not give us the information that we need to be able to know when we have it. So all that conversation about comparative effectiveness research and all that my colleagues have laid the groundwork and my friend Sean, who thinks clearly about it, and by the way, Sean's work is supported by the health plans in addition to other stakeholders. So I write a check. So does Aetna. We write checks to Sean because those things that Sean is doing is important. So don't get leave thinking, oh, we don't put our money where our mouth is, oh, that we're not invested in this stuff. We absolutely are invested in it. We have to know whether the new thing works, does it work better than the old thing, and if it is better, is the better justified the price escalation? That's the question. And there's nothing wrong with asking it. And I'm not going to ever let somebody make me feel nervous about asking that question because I sit every day with small business owners who've mortgaged their house two and three and four times to make a go of it, employing five people tenuously, watching their health care costs go through the roof because of all the nonsense that's out here. Why should they pay for stuff that doesn't work or doesn't work well in the total cost of care? So we have to know it. It's a responsible thing. And yes, there's rationing. And the rationing is on the backs of pregnant women in inner cities who don't get first trimester prenatal care and their babies die worse than 50 other countries in the world. We ration all kinds of stuff and nobody gets pissed off about it. So we got some issues to do as a community. The reason why I'm being so forceful about it is this. If your business model, if your purpose for doing what you are doing is to keep trying to game the system then yeah, health companies like ours are going to be some mean sons of guns. And we're going to hold you accountable and we're going to watch you and we're going to be really cautious. And is that a good reason to go to work every morning? It absolutely is not. What we want are people that start out with, let's do it right. Let's do it better. Let's find the answers to these things and then you will find willing partners. Now the reason why Sean is so important is after I give a talk like this, there'll maybe like 35, I go to these meetings with all the innovators and the startups and people that are gambling their money with venture capital. You get 30 of those people going, okay, I want to do comparative effectiveness research with you. I want to answer these kind of questions. I really want to get there. Now, what is the exam questions you're going to ask us? And we could spend every day of our lives, all day, answering questions about what is the gold standard for what we need. And we don't have that kind of time because we are trying to run our businesses. So Sean, I think, in his company is going to be very, very important as a place for people to go. So what I want, and I'll say it in front of my colleagues from the Blues, from Edna, what I really hope, and, and we have to be careful about the, 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 the lawyers and the, the thing. I'm not talking about what we're going to pay for anything, for the record. Don't care about what we're going to pay for. How much money are we going to reimburse? I'm not trying to price fix. I'm not going off to jail. But what I am saying is, why don't we, and that's what I think Sean's organization should become, in my opinion, the place where the plans increasingly say FDA criteria, necessary but not sufficient, not interested, thank you, glad you're not killing anybody, but the extra hurdle of comparative effectiveness research Here's what we want in terms of the questions that have to be answered. Just because your new hip articulation moves three degrees more than the old one, does anybody care? Because is it functionally significant or not? So that extra ingredient, whatever it is that we're looking for, we all say to the, in, to the researchers, the manufacturers, here's what we want. Now go program to that. So you don't have to do it but one time. And I think that's the way we sort of get at some of what you're trying to get to. But we have real problems in trying to develop that evidence to tell our customers. Now our customers are paying the bill. 
they are expecting somebody to watch out for their interests. And we don't have the information that we need, as we've said a hundred times, to do it. So randomized controlled trials versus coverage evidence development, these are really tough issues, and I don't have time to go through those anymore. But the bottom line here is that the key to any effort is broader use of analytics that can identify where the diagnostics can reduce downstream medical costs and improve health outcomes. So I'm talking about the total cost of care and the big picture. And then finally, the people who use these tools are going to also be changing. Fee for service is going to die. Understand it. Nobody can keep paying piecemeal for crap. It isn't going to survive. It can't. And it damn sure can't happen for the people you care the most about is your referral network, and that's the primary care doctors. The primary care doctors are done. There's no money for them. They're not making any money. Nobody goes into primary care. The only way primary care is going to survive is if they are able to take responsibility for a population of people, provide better quality, more cost-effective care, take the savings, have the savings reprogrammed, and pour it back into them for salary. Because nobody can write a check to primary care doctors because the unit costs and the cost escalation, there ain't no more money, the party's over. Well, guess what? The primary care doctor is going to look for the specialist and say, now look here, it becomes patently clear that this laboratory costs twice as much as the other laboratory, and my criteria, I'm being judged, my scorecard says I'm out of whack and my cost and reimbursement is going to affect. So why would I go to the highest cost lab when I need to go to a lower cost lab that still can keep quality whole? Why would I go to a specialist that screws around and orders 15 more imaging procedures that didn't need to be done? Why can't I go to a specialist who can't schedule my appointment for my patient the same day? Why can't I get 24-hour coverage? There's going to be a whole other realignment of specialty care downstream to solve and serve the primary care people who are going to be back in the driver's seat with a lot more control. So you are starting to think, what is my relationship as genetic, genetic providers to the primary care delivery system, and also in terms of how I'm going to be reimbursed for managing a population of people who have a predominance of genetic-based disease? This reimbursement model will increasingly be moving from fee-for-service to, to accountable and will move people from solo and three and five practitioners to groups, either real or virtual. But there will be changes and modifications across the board. And then finally, finally. After you've pleaded, begged, given people information, done everything you can do, got the contract, at the end of the day, you still got to do, as my, my colleague just mentioned, you got to do medical management because left to its own devices, people will piss away half the time. So unfortunately, we still have to go to work and go, why, why did you order the 18th MRI on that lady? Did you really need to do that? I mean, and that's just something I wish we didn't have to do, but we have to do. We have to align all the incentives. So, I know I've irritated like everybody in the room, but I, so I will just sort of end with this, this sort of sense, and we'll take, and then I'll be part of the group to take the questions if there is time. We need you to be successful. It is exceedingly important that you succeed, but you're not special. In many ways, you are part of an engine that is completely churning and moving and growing at rates that just cannot be sustained. It has to mean new models. Where you are special is at your highest, you have the potential to solve problems that most disciplines cannot because you're not halfway technologists. You're cutting through the crap get into the source of problems and can eliminate it. Your job is to figure out how to bring those to the delivery system in responsible ways so that you can save money and enjoy the savings and make money that way. But if you have business models that are based on Marcus Welby era thinking, you will not make it. You will have enemies. You will have people that will be holding you down and watching you. And at the end of the day, you will screw up your access to venture capital, which is the one thing you do not want to do. Health plans like us, Aetna, Blues, we want venture capital to love you because it's important that innovation succeed. So do it the right way, do it for the right reasons, and you'll have partners. Don't make enemies out of us because we love you. Okay. Is that, do we say, here endeth the lesson? Is that the word? I say, here endeth the lesson. Yeah, so, Michael. You know, and, and I, you know, 
I'm the last person in this room who should say that, but that's go on. Michael. Well, one thing that hasn't come up uh, is that the cost of the test uh, might in some part, even to a great part, be completely outside of health care. And people will be coming with their results to doctors and to health care systems. And the downstream costs might make those testing costs look tiny. So I would propose that we have a work group that collaborates with industry and others to, to really look at downstream cost uh, as well as cost of testing. I think there should be a work group that I think there should be a work group anyway uh, that gets it because, as I said, it's so important that we be aligned. You, we, we have to be friends. We just have to be. But in terms of that, I really like your point because what you're saying is, in reality, there are going to be a bunch of people that still want to know whether their baby is going to have blue eyes or not. And they're going to go offline and do whatever the heck they want to do. Um, and there are going to be people that are going to, you know, have, and so you're right. How you then, what, what do you wind up with when you get your neutrogenics for the new millennium uh, test and you walk into the doc's office and what is the responsibility the physician has to work that up with 18 MRI scans and how does that get paid for? I think you're just, your question is just spot on. Mark? Okay. We can make the case that a whole genome for $2,000 you know, instead of doing a blockbuster test would be a way to go and start doing that right now. Because then you could start to model Dave's question of how does that bring down overall costs, knowing about the whole genome. Yeah. So, so I think that's sort of, again, the, the notion of that kind of sort of big picture thinking. So if I understand your question is, does it make sense overall to and of course, I don't know how you figure it out, but if, if I understand your question, do we basically make a national investment in doing the entire genome sequencing for every person one time, store it, make multiple access to it under rules and provisions of privacy and confidentiality, I don't know, and then basically it's there, and then people can sort of fool with it or not, and what's the cost effectiveness of that, and, and what are the costs of storing it, what's the cost of accessing it, and the health information exchanges, and blah, 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 blah. But it's at least, it's, it's a question that needs to be asked, and it needs to be a question that needs to be answered. Um, Mark Retain, Chicago. I mean, I think that genomics is different in many ways. And <laughs> well, we, it keeps getting lumped under it keeps getting lumped under diagnostics. And as I mean, I'm a practicing oncologist. I'm very familiar with, with the waste and abuse and the patients I see. Uh, referred in from the outside to see us at the University of Chicago after they've been treated in the community with three trillion drugs that don't work and seven seven thousand MRIs and every diagnostic you can think of and CLIA approved CLIA laboratories and even some FDA approved diagnostics and I, and I cringe every Wednesday afternoon when I go to clinic. So, um, but I, I think the point is we don't need to be spending the kind of money that is currently being charged per polymorphism in laboratories. I mean, to go and order a single SNP, a one-off SNP, is, I don't know what list prices are these days, but the, you know, I usually say it's somewhere between $500 and $1,000 list price for most uh, CLIA laboratories. I don't know, Deborah can, can comment what, what goes on at her place, but you, you look at the Mayo website, and that's crazy. And, uh, and if you use those kind of estimates, of course you come up with figures that are just completely unmanageable when you start looking at genomics. But um, we don't need to be doing that, and we should be, we absolutely should be thinking of ways to implement genomics in a cost-effective manner. And whether it's whole genome sequencing or it's platforms to identify that they utilize uh, polymorphisms of clinical relevance to, to really do it en masse where you can drive the cost to pennies per, per variant, I think really allows this field to move forward in a way that is truly different. And uh, I keep coming back to the EMR because that's sort of an investment for the future that people have accepted. And I don't understand why we're not thinking about how genomics can, can be a whole new system. I guess I have a question, which is uh, I want to pick up on the um, themes of alignment of incentives and partnerships. And one of the reasons we're having these meetings is so that we could develop the, the right research agenda that will enable us to really realize the vision of NHGRI's, uh, you know, strategic plan. 
So, uh, so I'm, I'm, we're looking for um, people like you, the payers, to help us find our way. And um, I'm wondering whether there's a real possibility of partnering uh, and helping us design our studies with the appropriate metrics and funding them so that they will actually get done in a timely fashion so that it will actually benefit the whole ecosystem that you spoke of. And well, make available data that you have that we don't. I would uh, assume what my colleagues think, but that's what I was sort of, again, I'll just reemphasize, even though it is not a fully formed uh, proposal yet, but, but one that we have been talking about. And I think that I don't, I don't like recreating the wheel with creating new institutions and new organizations. I came here today along with my colleagues because we believe that this is an important forum that deserves our energy. I think that what Sean's group is trying to do is a wonderful place because it's, it's, it's where both the, the manufacturers, the innovators are sitting and the plans are sitting together. And so I would say that just to, in the interest of time, that your suggestion to me sounds terrific. I think that's, that we ought to try to at least use Sean's uh, house as a, as a place to get together and, 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 and fool around with this a little bit and do it in a hurry. Uh, that's my proposal with it, and I'm going to be talking more to my colleagues to see whether or not that, that, that dog will hunt. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry I forgot your name. It's, uh, it's Mark. Mark, right. So, uh, you know, I was just going to try to reemphasize. I mean, I, I think you're asking a critically important question, which, uh, um, you know, around this issue of, you know, the ways in which genetics is different, and, and you've described it, but, you know, the, the possibility that you're going to get, you know, thousands of SNPs or hundreds of thousands or whatever at, at a ridiculously low cost compared to these, you know, 21 sequence tests or whatever. And so, I mean, I th and I think that offers the possibility that, you know, there would be extraordinary ways to accomplish what Reed said, which is, you know, better outcomes for patients at dramatically lower costs, like huge. And I think that's the exciting, you know, opportunity. What I think, the way in which this technology is kind of the same in terms of what I heard at Medicare and I think what all the other payers here is, just pay for us now and we guarantee you you're going to save billions you know, <laughs> down the road. <laughs> and, and, and the, the Trust you know, I, I would say that, you know, if, if we actually saved one tenth of what was ever promised to me in a day at Medicare, you know, we wouldn't, the Medicare Medicaid thing would not be an issue. But so the, the real question is at what point do we sort of cross the threshold be between wanting to believe that this will happen, that this can t happen, and sort of, you know, being confident enough that we're, you know, sort of willing to make that investment. Because you know what I'm saying? And so it's sort of defining how do we make that happen where it isn't, you know, a, a tempting offer, but we just, you know, it's, it's like every other offer that says, you know, pay us now and you can't believe how great the world will be, you know, in the very near future. And, and I would just add that every technology company that comes in front of us comes with an economic model with assumptions of grandeur, and it never happens. It just, it just doesn't happen. Um, yeah. But that wasn't my question. <laughs> my question actually was to the laboratory folks. We talk about, you know, disruptive technologies, and one of those may be multiple appropriate SNPs on a chip that can bring dramatically, drop dramatically the price of the diagnostics. How does the laboratory business model fit into that? I mean, are you excited about a new technology that decreases your reimbursements dramatically? Okay. I think that we're, we recognize the same thing that everybody else recognizes, that the curve on health care expenditures is unsustainable to us, to you, to everybody else. And so to the extent that we can participate in developing um, uh, tools that would lead the industry in cost saving or more efficient delivery of care, we are absolutely on board. And we actually are working on a number of initiatives to do some of exactly what you're saying. In other words, where we can combine things together and actually offer them at a lower cost, where we can provide decision support tools that help the doctor order the right test at the right time. Um, there's a number of initiatives ongoing at LabCorp to support that. Yeah. Oh, okay. oh. Oh. Sorry, I'll tell you later. Uh, uh, I guess I was just going to bring up the, the, the concept when we were talking about people coming in I, with uh, tests from the outside. I mean, we don't even have standards for that. I mean, people do it now for genome-wide arrays that they can buy on the street and they get these reports maybe not anymore, 
but some of them probably still have some old ones and they come walking in with these things and want to know what this means. And I, I think more importantly in cancer, I think there are many providers outside of the arena that's sitting in this room that are going to provide people and they're going to buy it off the street a cancer test and because they believe this is their you know this is what they need and uh, I think that we are going to have to think about those downstream costs when they come in with those tests that we don't have access to necessarily all the primary data So to, to speak to Joanne's question about um, the diagnostic tests, you know, if I look at our one of our um, d disease panel tests, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, the cost for that test has not dropped at all in the eight years we've been doing it, but the content has increased. So we've increasingly multiplexed from two genes to now 46 genes, but not raised the price of the test. So even though the test costs hasn't been dropping, we've been able to add content over the years, um, and, and that's where we save. And from a business argument, as a lab laboratory, we often compete on content between labs. And so we're constantly trying to add content to outcompete our, our competitors in terms of a better test. But, but if we look at to the question of scaling to the genome, because there's a lot of efficiency to be saved by getting multiple markers in the same test, you know, I, I love the email Mike sent me, sent us a few minutes ago, a whole genome should, should actually be whole genome without the W, H-O-L-E, <laughs> um, because there's still so many holes in it. And I would argue if we implement whole with the H genome sequencing today, there's so many holes that we will have to reflex onto the targeted test after the genomic test is either uninterpretable or negative. And so you, you haven't yet saved that cost. We eventually will get there when the W gets added into the, to the, you know, the picture. Okay. So, <laughs> Mary, I, I don't, I don't want to stop this discussion. Mary, David, Deborah. I guess I just wanted to be sure, you know, there's something in between single gene tests and whole exome or whole genome tests, and and so there are several arrays like that. So is, just to clarify from the payers, is the concern about running an array for 225 genes that costs less than a single gene test, that medical care costs will go up in general because clinicians will work up additional findings from those 225 genes that they wouldn't have otherwise had you only given them one test result? I mean, what you, you say that you think we're, you know, you've been hoodwinked before being sold that things will save money in the long run, but it's very hard for us to understand why should we test for only one gene at a time when we definitely have some array-based technology that can test for at least hundreds of genes, at least as well, for a fraction of the cost? Yeah, I think it's an area under development, number one. Uh, I would say my first reaction is we cover things where the medical evidence is strong and, and the society say you should do this. So I think I know, you know, my, my area is uh, reproductive genetics. Um, so you would say, we had this discussion last night, you know, if for Ashkenazi Jewish screening, uh, ACOG says four mutations, ACMG says 11 or 13 or something, Genzyme does it, you know, whatever. Uh, what's the right answer? So the first question is, you know, we, we're out there saying that we're trying to support but what would, be the, what would be the downside of having a test that covers all of those plus more? Okay, so maybe in Ashkenazi Jewish populations, no downsides. Side. I'm thinking of, you know, the 100 genes on a chip that were just direct, started as a direct-to-consumer we counsel technology specifically, that now is put in reproductive endocrinology, IVF offices. These physicians are interpreting this. They're getting results on maybe one thing they wanted, a CF test, 99 things they never heard of before, and then it's churning through the, it's either ignoring things that are potentially important, churning services through the system, and I think we just don't know what to do with that. Uh, when we were talking about the radiology example, what, what I was actually reminded of is, you know, medical school 101 lesson, which is if you are interested in pathology in the chest, you aim the x-ray technologies at the chest. You get your hand slapped if you actually looked at the appendix or the gallbladder or something else. Now, sometimes you'll find disease there and you'll say, God, wasn't I lucky? But often you're finding things that you don't 
you didn't anticipate, you don't know what they mean, you, you know, you've got these variants of unknown significance, et cetera, and those things churn through the system. So I think this is what we're str They take money to work up. They do take money to work up. For sure they take money to work up. So let's, let, uh, quick comments and uh, let's keep this discussion going. Deborah? Uh, uh, David, no, no I, 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 I'm, I'm watching him. <laughs> so I'm sorry, I'm sorry. So I think it's interesting that, Joanna, you pointed out that um, the testing costs are only point less than 0.5 percent of overall health care costs. So I, I think when we look at testing, the testing costs are actually a very small portion of the health care costs. They drive a lot of the decisions, medical decisions. And I think what we have to be talking about, what you guys have to be talking about, I'm not part of this, but is, is how you do genomic medicine. And, and so it's how this testing fits into the entire pathway of patient care and what makes sense and is useful to test for because there's something actionable that can be done versus the discovery part that should be research and not part of genomic medicine. Uh, it's genomic medicine research, but not part of the health system and healthcare process. And in my small project that I've, pilot project that I've been approved to do with hospital funding is, is looking at an entire care pathway from how we identify the patients and enroll them and consent them and all the way through to how, you know, we do the testing, but then how that information is communicated back, what decisions we would make, having genomic case conferences, I mean, the whole entire pathway and only testing for the things that would be clinically actionable, potentially. And I think that's where we have to get to. But, but just think, though, just remember. Please, yeah. So I think it's, it's a very great question and, and point, but, and, and, and into the question before, please don't misinterpret anything that, that Naomi, Joanna, or I are saying is drawing lines in the sand. Just because something is expensive, first of all, does not make us nervous. It's the total cost of care, as I tried to say in my presentation, that we are interested in. D Naomi, I thought, did a very good job of, of showing, for example, the number of times where a diagnostic test is decoupled in terms of its behavior with the therapeutics that's based upon the presence of what the diagnostic test would show. We love a test that is, even if it's expensive diagnostically, that will allow us to titrate the appropriate subpopulation for whom a therapeutic is involved, fine. We give away, darn near, expensive chemotherapy drugs for leukemia. We subsidize them because the total cost of care means that that patient is not going to be in the ER, is not going to have hospitalizations, will decrease readmissions, and all in, it's less. So there's nothing that scares us about costliness. It's if it's justified. So I just want to make sure that we don't argue that kind of thing out. And then what you get to, I think, is both of these questions is being clear about the particular clinical paradigm that is under discussion and making sure that we understand that. So we do not, we are agnostic to, 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 you know, we're not trying to draw these major lines and saying, oh my God, no, no, no. Case by case, specific by specific. Now that's where the problem lies, is the capacity of the American Comparative Effectiveness Research Engine, not to mention our clinical research engine, to answer the plethora of questions that are on board. And that's why Naomi, if I understand her presentation, why she decided to include the things she did, included what was on the list that came out of the IOM and what's on the list for PCORI to get looked at. And she's sort of saying, listen, folks, is there a relationship between the priorities of the research enterprise and the fundamental clinical questions that are the most determinate from a quality and cost effectiveness point of view? So those are challenges that you're going to need to be active in. So we hope that you will be attentive to that because you can't answer everything all the time. David, and then. Okay. So you're going to take a, a, take a, a, a chit for later. Yeah, uh, I wanted to. Oh, was somebody behind me? No, no, this Irvin again. Wanted to second uh, Deborah's statement about. I think the discussion has been focused uh, very much on cost of SNPs and tests and all that, but 
I think what we really need is help in determining the value, not so much the cost. I think, you know, and thinking of it in terms of there needs to be research first that ties this into care pathways and has the whole game for this pathway, the whole picture for a pathway, uh, you know, at the as, as an outcome. At, at the end, and and that the question is value, not so much that the SNPs are cheap and the genome is a thousand dollars, but what value do we get out of it? And then we can make a case for our community to be accepted. I want to come back to a point that Jeff Ginsburg was making about engagement with the, the payers. And uh, we talked a little bit about those that back in December, the, those of you that were at the meeting. But there, uh, certainly in, in, our, in our little experience with the Blue Cross Blue Shield North Carolina, when we talked about endpoints that they care about, uh, there was a little bit of overlap with academic endpoints, but not a lot. Um, and we've done a study with them where we have an MOU in place where if we meet the endpoints that they chose, they will implement it across the state. If we don't, we'll shut up and not ask them to do it again. And I think we need to do more of that, where we partner, where the endpoint is decisive, uh, at least for the moment, decisive uh, information, where we can either uh, be quiet or have it implemented. And you know, right now we, we play around that. Um, but I think we need your partnership for that. We, we need some of your money, but we need more your choice of endpoints. Because I never thought uh, adherence at the e end of one year for statins was an endpoint that I would ever care about. But Blue Cross Blue Shield not only cared about it, but they're willing to pay for it. So you know, there's, there's things there that we just don't, we don't recognize. Um, as usual, my opinions represent just my opinion and not um, the Air Force or the Department of Defense. Um, so I just wanted to issue the same two challenges that are my usual personal crusade, and that is using international standards to measure value in this country, which would be quality-adjusted life years, not American dollars. And then the second one has to do with the fact that what we're talking about, why I ask myself why on God's green earth am I in this job? And that's because what we're talking about is culture change. This is a paradigm shift. If we continue to talk about why this doesn't make sense when we are Western trained physicians and we label disease and treat it without looking at the underlying cause, we're going to continue to have the same debates over and over again. Because looking at the genetic basis of disease is something that is, in theory, looking at the underlying cause, not what we're necessarily trained to do as um, MDs or DOs. So, thank you. I, um, while we all beat up on the healthcare system and the practicality of it not being able to continue the way it is, it is, and it's picking up on the last speaker's uh, comment, something between 19, uh, 1960 and the present has changed life expectancy from just about 60 to something about 80, and the healthcare system and everybody involved in it is partially responsible for that. As a follow-up question, I'd be interested in the perspective of the third-party payers on the new data that suggests the de novo mutation in the conditions of autism, schizophrenia, and mental retardation is, looks like it's compellingly clinically useful. There's no FDA approval. There's no clinical test that you can actually get for that. But it looks like the data that's recently published is overwhelmingly compelling that these conditions. I don't want to get drawn into or have any impression left of artificial tussles. We are in no way are we arguing about, well, first of all, in no way are we arguing. But again, what we are definitely not arguing about is how terrific the American medical care delivery system is. 
I am, uh, I serve on the head of NIH's advisory committee. I am very proud of the American biomedical and research community. Um, I am the former doc for the AMA. I am very proud of American medicine. There isn't anybody up here talking about not being happy about the, the, the fantab fantabulously wonderful benefits of, the, of, of our clinical care delivery system. However, let's make no mistake, our life expectancy is 42nd in the world. And we, and, and we pay uh, orders of magnitude more in health care than any of the other countries that are better than us 41 times. So there is an American conversation that has to occur about how and where we use our precious health care assets that is unavoidable for a mature, civilized democracy. So we do have some tough issues to deal with. But at the end of the day, um, we, we, let's just be all an amen on the fact that, yes, nobody's here trying to say we're not doing a good job um, in terms of the things we do. Now, in terms of what I really like, though, is your last comment, which gets to this point that we at least that we've been, all three of us, trying to make around cut through halfway stuff and get to the root cause. So if your autism example is true, you know, and it's there and we can get at that and understand that better. Because the last thing that I want to do as a person who has to make decisions about using dollars that are hard earned by American workers, the last thing I want to do is give them an inadequate treatment for a disease that we don't understand and that can be better proven. Because anybody has had to deal with the development of the disabled world and I've run major systems of care for the development disabled. I understand that world real well. So at the end of the day, if we can get some stuff that cuts through and helps us, th you'd be out of your mind not to want it. Now the issue then you raise is, okay, how do we, among the 50 priorities that we have in this country to get to root cause stuff that we are really in it, where does autism fit in it? What is the role of health plans who have to spend hard-earned employers' dollars to be able to say, we're going to, you know, put that dollars to this one and not this one and this one and not that one. How does that fit into the PCORI with the national re These are the kind of issues that a forum like this has to think about be in your profession and then be prepared to discuss it with those who are outside of your field so that we can come to some priority decisions around the research enterprise. Because guess what, by the way, there ain't doodly squat clinical researchers around anymore. And when you finally get those, then you got to worry about the, the people that are going to do the cost effectiveness stuff. Oh, by the way, then you got to do the health services research. Oh, by the way, somebody's got to turn it into clinical guidance. Oh, by the way, somebody's got to do performance measurement. So what did we just do to the workforce for research and all of that. So priority, priority, priority. And I'm not saying your priority is wrong. I'm just saying how do you have that conversation? So Paul Ritker has been waiting patiently. Last comment. Quick comment, Paul. So I'm going to choose my words extremely carefully for a second here. Uh, and partly because I have a conflict of interest, but more because of a bigger issue, I think. So, so Naomi, Joanne, and Reed have argued, among other things, that they would favor potentially expensive diagnostic tests if it might actually limit therapy or get to the right people. I think that's probably correct. My experience in the diagnostic industry and the payers is that you also fear diagnostic tests if they expand therapy. And this has to do with my own technology and issues about how hard it was to get certain companies to pay for CRP testing, even though we had randomized trials showing you could save lives. And lower event rates. And that includes United Healthcare, which is a huge battle. So I think this is another side of this, which is we have to ask questions about even when overwhelming evidence exists, there's tremendous resistance to wanting to change. And I think that's also a part of what Sean has to struggle with. But we can talk about that. We can have a, a, an hour long discussion. And no, I think no, we'll. Because we'll um, there's no need for. For us to be, at least for, I'll speak for me, and I'll see if my colleagues disagree, for us to be defensive. Is it possible that we make mistakes? Is it possible we are wrong sometimes? Is it possible that, you know, we make the wrong choice? Absolutely. And do we need to change? That's why I said, and I was very transparent, so I will agree with you, because it's important that we find common ground here as opposed to leaving. 
because the, po the only point of all this could be, has to be we keep working together. So at the end of the day, I said, we do go run down the hallway screaming when somebody tells me they got three more bells and two whistles. We do do that. That is our behavior. And I also am saying deliberately to you, we're trying to stop doing that dumb stuff. So we're trying to be different. So I, I, I accept your premise, and if we were wrong, I apologize. Yeah, the, the other thing that I would add to it is that we cover thousands and thousands of things. And those things require hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of technology assessment conversations, deliberations, interactions with the technology people. It is sometimes hard to get eight, and I don't know the example that you're talking about, but it's sometimes hard to get the attention of a large organization. It, it is very helpful to get technology assessments done through the medical professional colleges, CMPT, others that can help, help synthesize at EGAP. Uh, that sort of gets to a higher level of attention and organization and quicker decision making. I don't know the example uh, that you're, you're speaking of, but. Uh. So I, I will, I, I'm the chairman, I'm going to stop, but I'm going to say one thing. If, if the autism example is true, then it's just one uh, illustration of the real promise of this kind of new technology, which has been around for years, not decades. And so we're, this is the beginning of a long conversation. Uh, and uh, we will we'll resume in 11 minutes. <laughs> Uh, my, my computer says it's 3.39, so we'll start again at 10 to 4. <laughs> <laughs>